was one of the squamous dysplasias and so forth, and leukoplakia. This is the most common reason for an oral biopsy, is a white lesion, and this is in the most characteristic location, right on the lateral margin of the tongue. This is a high-risk location uh, for dysplasia and for squamous carcinoma, and so that's always an important site for them to examine. I was interested to see that um, at the time of biopsy, uh, a high proportion already have dysplasia or carcinoma present when you see leukoplakia. Um, if it's just an otherwise uncomplicated leukoplakia, though, a very early stage sort of thing, about 10 or 15% of those will ultimately progress to become carcinoma. So it would be ideal if we had uh, a means of early detection and a means of treatment at a low stage, at early stage, a pre-malignant stage. Other places to look, of course, to the floor of the mouth and the soft palate. I really like this diagram uh, that sort of gives you a, a progression uh, sort of scheme for how uh, leukoplakia may be considered as a progressive disorder. Um, because the risk of invasive neoplasia and the risk of there being dysplasia progresses across this diagram. So if you just have hyperkeratosis and thickening acanthosis, maybe a few lymphocytes, that's pretty low risk. That's a, a thin, smooth leukoplakia. But as it becomes thicker or more fissured, uh, you may begin to see uh, occasional dysplasia in that type of a lesion. If it gets more complicated, verrucoid appearing, uh, then you're going to see more inflammation and higher likelihood of finding dysplasia. When it is no longer uh, leukoplakia but becomes erythroplakia, a red, then uh, almost all of those lesions have uh, some dysplasia associated with them and may have invasive carcinoma um, in that situation. So the grading and identification of dysplasias in the oral mucosa are a critical uh, step. Um, and this is based on our usual criteria, of course, psychology and so forth. But there are particular architectural features where we're more likely to find dysplasia. And so I want to review these features uh, with you and what they look like. Because these findings should alert you to look more closely for cytologic atypia or irregular maturation or organizational disarray or potentially involvement of salivary ducts or other structures that would be indicative of uh, dysplasia. So this first one, bulky hyperplasia, is just essentially a thickening. But you can see that, you know, if this is the normal over here, it's two, three, maybe even four times normal thickness. Uh, it has a smooth border and so forth. But seeing this kind of, of thickening should alert you to ask the question, do I have dysplasia? And if you see some level of atypia, perhaps in an area like that, uh, you might then be more likely to identify correctly that this is, in fact, uh, a dysplasia. Uh, when you see verrucous hyperplasia, that also is a marker for possible dysplasia. Uh, so you can have hypergranulosis and this very thickened uh, scaly crust uh, along with that. Uh, notice there's really not perikeratosis here. Uh, but if you were to begin to scan around the basal area, the basal layers here, you would see some variation in the nuclei, uh, probably some increased mitotic activity, and so you might be inclined to call that a low-grade dysplasia. But you should at least be looking for that if you have this kind of a pattern. Uh, this is one that I hadn't recognized before, although we, we see this, uh, and I appreciated learning this as I studied for this lecture. Uh, the so-called drop-shaped papillae. So this is sort of dra draped like a drop. It's rounded or sort of bulbous. And these are not the normal configuration of the reading. So when you see that, 
even in a thin mucosa, you should look very carefully to see, well, there's a supervasal or mitotic figure. This may be dysplasia. So looking carefully in these situations will probably help you to pick that up, even though it's uh, just a fairly thin mucosa. Another feature uh, is a very sharp boundary between hyperkeratosis and normal mucosa. So when you see that type of juncture, you should think, ah, molecular event has happened, changed on this side. Is there dysplasia? Ask that question. And then you might be able to identify that. Uh, another feature that I haven't uh, illustrated is um, this one up at the beginning. Let's talk about this. Hyperkeratosis with atrophy. So the usual hyperkeratosis is like this, where you get some acanthosis. And that's normal to look at that. But if you see a thin mucosa like this with hyperkeratosis, that also is a marker for uh, uh, dysplasia. We want to identify these in an early stage so that we don't have to deal with squamous cell carcinoma. But the truth is, is that many patients present and they already have a squamous cell carcinoma. Locations for this are not surprisingly based on the risk factors. You know what the risk factors are for oral cancers. Well, smoke and tobacco products top the list. They're right up there at the top. And so, and these are related to these, uh, you know, mutation-inducing chemicals. The areca nut, I don't know if that's a relative of betel nut or not. Um, do you know, is betel nut uh, more frequently associated with squamous carcinomas? Is that a recognized factor for you? I think this is one that gives people kind of red teeth rather than black teeth, which are more common in a, a few uh, betel nut users in, in Asia. Uh, HPV is, also has an association with uh, squamous cancers, as does alcohol consumption. And then patients who have a transplant and are on prolonged immunosuppression are subject to squamous cancers in the mouth, the perianal areas, the vulva and vagina as well. So whenever I come across a list like this for a cancer, I look and say, my, my goodness, many of these are very, very preventable. What, what are we doing to impact our society and change the incidence? Because these are not, this is not a fun cancer to deal with. So if you want to have something to think about in your spare time, that's what I suggest. So the prognostic factors in squamous carcinoma are uh, thickness, so measuring the depth of invasion. Uh, that correlates very nicely with recurrences, with nodal mets, uh, and with survival. But also the pattern of invasion. Does it have a rounded pushing margin? Does it have an infiltrative margin, uh, et cetera? That may imply better or worse prognosis. If we have vascular invasion or perineural invasion or bone invasion, that usually corresponds to this thickness as well, uh, but is a somewhat independent factor in addition. And if you have a patient who's had one cancer, it's usually because they've been exposed in a broad area to those chemicals. And so they are still at risk for follow-up tumors, for second tumors as well. Uh, the treatment for these uh, disorders can be simple excision if they're superficial, wedge excision if it's on the lip or something like that. But as the deeper progression occurs, uh, they may need combination x-ray therapy and chemotherapy, plus or minus uh, lymph node dissection of varying levels of the, of the neck. So if you get those specimens where they've got bilateral neck dissections and a little piece of the tongue and submandibular gland, you realize that, that the surgery for this can be quite uh, disfiguring and quite significant surgery. So to me, that just says, we got to raise the flag and say, it's time to prevent these cancers by 
eliminating or reducing the use of tobacco and tobacco products and so forth. Now I'll talk a little bit about some of the subtypes of squamous carcinomas real quickly. Um, these do not particularly have prognostic value in and of themselves, but we see them differently. So sarcomatoid squamous carcinoma typically presents as a polypoid lesion, uh, but it may have a, a polypoid component and, and a deeply invasive component. Um, these will usually have some expression of cytokeratins or P63 or other markers that say they have an orig origin in the squamous uh, mucosa. Um, and so that, this can sometimes be patchy, however. So if you just have a biopsy, it looks sarcomatoid, think first of sarcomatoid squamous carcinoma before you start thinking of rhabdo or something else. Uh, the basaloid squamous carcinomas are an important uh, subtype. Um, my colleague, Dr. Gillies, talked about this here a couple of years ago. Uh, but these have a very bluish uh, organization. They have paradoxical central keratinization. Um, and they may have a little bit of a peripheral palisade, although not always. Um, they're important to recognize because they do have a slightly worse prognosis and they're more likely to present with nodal mets at an early, state, at an early uh, point in time. Um, there are a few of these that have an HPV association, but the sorting out that out is still in process. Um, the differential diagnosis uh, will oftentimes include a neuroendocrine carcinoma. Um, and then this HPV-associated non-keratinizing carcinoma, uh, we'll talk about slightly separately um, here in a second. Oh, well, here it is. Here it is. So this is usually in younger patients. So if you see a, a 25 or a 35-year-old with an oral cancer, think about HPV-associated uh, tumor, um, especially if it's non-keratinizing. Uh, we also need to think about this when we are presented with a non-keratinizing cancer in the neck, in a neck node or something like that that can be a manifestation of this. And this is usually associated with uh, these more uh, oncogenic HPV types. As I understand, uh, 18, 33, and 35 are, are a little bit more common in uh, Vietnam than 16 or 31, uh, but uh, I don't know. Um, because this is a non-keratinizing type, the differentiation from basaloid squamous carcinoma can be somewhat diff difficult. Um, and if I got a basaloid tumor, I would probably still stain it for uh, P16 to see if there was evidence of HPV infection, just because the prognosis might be changed. So here's an example kind of what these look like. Uh, as you can see, they do, do tend to have this lymphoid association. Uh, they're not quite as basaloid as the basaloid squamous carcinomas, um, and they, but they don't have keratinization. Uh, they usually are solid, so you can recognize them as a squamous type of uh, lesion. Uh, this type, adenoid squamous cell carcinoma, is really kind of an acantholytic type of carcinoma. You see it just sort of falls apart into single cells. Uh, because of this, though, it can be uh, confused with adenocarcinomas at times, and you may think, well, is this a, a poorly differentiated adenocarcinoma or something else? Um, but if you recognize its origin on a squamous mucosa, that will help you, um, and as opposed to originating in a salivary uh, gland. And lastly, a verrucous carcinoma occurs in the oral cavity. Um, also has this uh, strong connection to tobacco, although in this case usually smokeless tobacco, which I don't think is highly used in, in Vietnam. Um, most common locations reflecting the use of smokeless tobacco are right along the alveolar ridge or on the buccal, buccal mucosa or in the mandibular uh, sulcus, where people would tend to put their uh, uh, tobacco. There are some cases that have an HPV association, not usually. Um, and it's important to recognize this because if they choose to radiate it, that actually may be a bad sign. So you don't want to call it just standard squamous cell carcinoma and have them go ahead to radiate it. 
uh, if it's a truly a verrucous type of cancer. And these, as we know, can be very well differentiated, or are very well differentiated with very little uh, atypia uh, to be seen. In contrast, uh, papillary squamous cell carcinoma can have somewhat similar architecture to uh, the uh, architecture that we see with Verruca's tumor, uh, but this does have more pronounced atypia, and it will have parakeratosis and dyskeratosis uh, as well. Another very helpful uh, finding is these microabscesses uh, at the tips of the papillae or in other areas. Um, and this has a usually a better prognosis as well. So there is a CAP protocol for uh, examination and reporting of these specimens, which I'll just highlight here. Interestingly, uh, this protocol also includes melanoma. So uh, that's a useful thing to remember if you have an oral melanoma as well. 